Hi, it's Corbett Harrison, and today we're going to talk about interactive learning objectives. Basically, that means using what I call essential questions or I can statements effectively in the classroom. Uh, let's start with the research that backs up this idea. Um, I always go back to my good old friend Robert Marzano, who came up with through his synthesis of research, he came up with the nine strategies that if teachers got better at doing with their students, their students would be better with student achievement, especially student achievement as it pertains to uh, standardized tests, which is not the most important thing, but student achievement is. These are the nine strategies. Uh, I'm teaching an online class right now in curriculum design, and we've talked about of these strategies throughout the class. Um, notice I've highlighted number seven because that's what essential questions and interactive learning objectives are all about. Setting those objectives with students and then providing feedback as we progress through the lesson or the particular unit. Uh, in my first year of teaching, uh, my administrator, only thing he required should he stop by and observe was he expected to see the objective written on the chalkboard. So with my yellow chalk, there it would be. Um, in today's uh, society, um, we might have uh, a standard related to them. Back in the olden days when I was teaching without standards, before they existed, I uh, didn't have to do this. Um, the funny part of this story to me is my administrator that first year stopped by this many times in my classroom to uh, observe. He saw the objective was written there, didn't seem to mind that I really wasn't pointing it out to the students. It was there for my administrator, not for my students. Um, and I just have to tell you, that's a bad way of doing it. You have to put it up there. If you're going to have an objective listed, it needs to be an interactive element of your teaching, not just something there for anyone who stops by and just wants to know what you're teaching that particular day. Students need to be aware of what you're teaching that day, too. And so what I like to do is I like to turn my objectives into essential questions. And here's what an essential question is. An essential question is a question that at the end of teaching a lesson or the end of teaching a unit, it's a quality question that a student could answer well to prove that they got the main idea out of your lesson or your unit. Great essential questions don't have right answers. They you can keep coming back to them, adding more lessons, and the answer to the essential question could get just smarter and smarter with each bit of teaching. But it's a way to, uh, it's that inquiry question that dangles in front of my students like a carrot in front of an um, animal that likes carrots uh, and uh, just leads them ahead through the learning. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for clues that will help you answer this particular question better. Of course, they have to interact with it, and this is one of my favorite tools for having them interact with it. Um, we have little laminated cards that have 1 through 10 on them, and we put colored paper clips on them. And before we learn, I show them a sense of question, and they rate how do they think they could answer that question right now. To what degree could you come up with a quality answer? Usually their first time it's 1, 2, three. Um, after I demonstrate, sometimes we revisit again and we see if the paper clip moves. Um, if it does, I can ask them about it. Why did you move it? What do you have now? What, what, what did you learn? Um, after they try it out with a partner or in a group, I like to ask. And then after they try it out independently, these are all signposts that I uh, choose to use when I'm having students interact with me. I'm able to give them feedback and have discussions with them as the paper clip moves forwards or sometimes goes back a few steps so that I can uh, provide that element of feedback that it's not just putting the essential question up there, but it's having communication about the uh, essential question. Um, I have a lot of teachers, including me, who like I can statements instead of essential questions, which just basically turns the question into a declarative statement. Um, and uh, so you'll notice how it just slightly changed here. I can statements don't work very well with content standards. They work better with process standards when you're having students learning to do something because that's what you're asking them to rate is their ability to do this um, before learning, after the learning, etc. And so um, this is just a tool that I use. The kids keep it right in the corners of their desks. I can walk around and have questions and answers for them and get answers from them um, as their paperclip moves throughout learning. Just one way to make it interactive. Let's go to another piece of research that I use here. Um, McTy and Wiggins Understanding by Design model. Um, they break essential questions into what they call overarching essential questions and topical 
those essential questions. And um, I don't, uh, I'm just going to look at the top two examples in both columns here. If your overarching question is in what ways does art reflect as well as shape culture, you have to assume that you're creating a, uh, a unit here uh, that will study multiple cultures um, and how art is shaped by those cultures. Um, so that's a unit plan because it's not just going to be one lesson. It's going to be um, if you move over to the right-hand side, one of the lessons might be um, how ceremonial masks and the Inca culture, uh, how, what we learned about their their perception of art. Um, if, if we think about those, uh, you would assume that it wouldn't be the only topical uh, or lesson that they would do. Maybe they'd do one on uh, Native American um, Native American uh, art and how it reflected on that particular culture. So um, multiple topical questions often feed. What I want you to notice there is that the overarching question, all of the topic questions would somehow fit underneath the umbrella of the overarching essential questions. Um, for the uh, for my students, uh, when we create our unit and our two lessons, uh, I am going to expect there to be a unit level question and then le lesson level essential questions that fit underneath. That. So I'll call them unit and lesson level questions. Uh, McTie and Wiggins just have a different name for them. Um, McTie and Wiggins talk about this great thing called six facets of understanding. Uh, you want to write quality questions and you want to find models that help you write a variety of questions. When your questions become predictable, that's when students stop paying attention to them. And so um, McTie and Wiggins came up with these things they call the six facets of understanding, six different ways to think with your brain about similar information and here they are. Uh, the first one here is the facet of explanation, part of the brain that talks about why is that, what explains that, what's an example for that. You're explaining your understanding of knowledge in those with those particular kinds of questions. Then there's the interpretation level, what does it mean and why does the meaning matter and what in our human experience um, can we learn from this. So uh, those are all what you'd consider interpretation questions. Application is the bare minimum level I expect my um, teachers to kind of focus on. And that is how would you, in a different context, use this? If you were in this situation instead of the one we did in class, how would this knowledge be useful? And so that's called the application level. Perspective is an interesting one. If you think about it this way, what's another perspective? How might they think about it that's differently? And why would they think about it differently? Those are similar but different from the empathy facet of understanding. Um, why does it seem this way to you? Why do you feel about it this way but someone else feels about the content this particular way? What is it in your experience and their experience that makes you feel different ways about it? Empathy questions. And then finally, probably my favorite facet is called the self-knowledge. Um, when you are unconscious of your own incompetence, um, you are starting to explore the relative. Uh, the area of what's called um, self-knowledge. Not knowing what you don't know, but starting to make discoveries about what you don't know. Um, why didn't you know that? What are you going to do differently now that you do know it? Applying it to yourself and what you, the sense you're making of the world are, are self-knowledge questions. Uh, I'm going to show you um, these six uh, facets having an influence on the types of questions I might present to my students. And so if I was teaching tone and mood in writing, there's an explanation question. Just tell me what it is, what does an author do to make it happen? Explanation questions. And there are interpretation questions. Why does an author need to do this? What does it, why is it intended to, to, to modify a reader's experience? You have to interpret the concept of what they are in order to explain that to me. Application, if we're studying it in narrative writing, what does it look like in expository and persuasive writing? I've switched the context for them. Perspective. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll read a paper that someone has no problem with, but someone else gets insulted by the tone of the author. Why would that be? Who 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 would that be that got insulted and what explains it? Um, and then empathy feelings. Um, why does attempts work on some people to establish mood, but it doesn't work on me as a reader? What what's happening in my from my empathy? That, that's not jiving with what you're getting at. You felt this, I did not feel this. What's the difference here? The empathy question. And then, so with self-knowledge questions, I often go back to look at things we've looked at earlier on before we knew the concept of tone and mood. Um, for example, we read a 
Sylvia Plath poem right in the beginning of um, of my, my seventh grade year. And then we learn about tone and mood nine, ten weeks later. We go back and look, why didn't we know this then? Why didn't we notice tone and mood was going on here? And so the students can say, oh, well, now I understand this. They've arrived at some self-knowledge. Now, here's the idea. You don't make six essential questions for every lesson or you it, but this challenges you to kind of create questions from different areas of your brain for their brains, and you can pick and choose. You can choose just your two favorite. You can choose your four favorite. You could choose all six if you choose to, but it's a variety of different types of questions you could be asking them. Um, you can do this with other formats, not just the six facets of understanding. In my class, we read an article that mentioned Guilford's structure of intellect theory, where there are six different levels of arriving at intellect and what the article suggested is you take four of those areas and you create questions for them. These are the questions from the article which is cited there but they have a cognition question, a divergent question, a convergent question, and an evaluation question all for the purpose of getting students to remember uh, these particular questions. Uh, obviously the students have read an article about um, nuclear power plants and a tsunami and so here the first question is pretty basic and then other questions require some deeper thinking, um, and so questions can kind of move in that prog progression sometimes. You can always use blooms to make questions. Now here's questions I created for a very simple concept. I'm just going to teach you one word. Um, I normally would not make essential questions for a lesson that just teaches one word, but just to kind of show you how blooms, how you move a question through blooms. What does the word mean? That's the remember level. How can I correctly use it? That's the understanding level. What's a different place I could use this um, is the apply level of blooms. Uh, what words other than supercilious, what synonyms might work better? That's forcing them to analyze and think about different situations. Evaluate if you found two poems that both had the word supercilious in them, which poet used it better? Why do you think that? And so getting them to that level, evaluate, and then create. Um, and this again goes to my concept of student-centered classroom. Let's create a mnemonic device for the fifth graders sitting in the room next door to help them remember what this great vocabulary word means. And so creating something to help someone else, uh, using blooms as a guide to help you create questions. Again, you don't have to use all six, but that's moving through the scale of blooms. Um, I can easily turn these all into I can statements. If you prefer the I can statement, here they are. I won't read them to you again. But do notice, all I've done is I've turned them into uh, I can declarative statements, which is a technique. And then here's a technique we kind of invented during a training once. I always like this one. Um, connecting questions, processing questions to transforming questions. Three levels of questions. A connecting question uh, is a question to activate prior knowledge or to link to a previous lesson. You connect back to something that you already know. Um, if we were going to read an article on leukemia, this would be a connecting question. What do you already know about different types of cancer? With processing questions, you focus on what's the heart of being taught. And so assuming we're reading an article on leukemia, here are two questions that we might be able to answer during that instruction or at the end of that instruction. So processing questions are, I'm giving you information, can you answer these questions based on it? And then transforming questions are, now what? You've learned this, what good will this do for you or for society? And so um, what can our class do to help educate society about leukemia? That's a great transforming question because again, it sets up a whole student-centered kind of project in mind. And so um, I am designing um, a unit and two lessons within that unit as I'm expecting my students to do. Um, for my unit, my students are gonna read Steinbeck and um, they're gonna have to write an essay um, about theme and characterization. Steinbeck is a difficult text, and so I call this my difficult text unit. Um, for my three essential questions for the unit, I, I used, instead of I cans, can I's, which I like to do sometimes. Um, and then you're seeing one of my lessons essential questions here. Um, to find a theme in a story, you need to understand dynamic and static characters that give you clues. And so um, for these ones, I did the connecting process and transforming questions. I'll let you pause and look at them because I'm running out of time. Here's my second set of questions. Can I turn them into can we's here because we're going to be interpersonally doing these as groups during one of the lessons where we're interpreting a difficult text and reminding ourselves what context clues are. And you'll see the verbs underlined. Take them kind of through the blooms level. 
tools. Again, um, setting up questions uh, is a powerful thing to do. Thanks for your time today. I hope you've learned some techniques for making.